Yeah, thank you very much, Adele, for this very warm welcome. I'm, I'm feeling very good right now. <laughs> um, and it was an amazing time in Les Ouches that we had together over there. And yeah, and I hope those books can really uh, make some difference in, in the Philippines where you can use them now. And so, okay, I'm going to start to uh, share my screen, I think, for the talk. So you should see the slides now. Okay, so yeah, my talk is uh, called From Physics to Biology and Back Again. And so Adele asked me to, to tell you a little bit about all the different stuff that I already did in research that I was able and happy to do. And first thing I did when she asked me to give you this talk, of course, was to look up how far away actually uh, the Philippines are on, on Google Maps and Google tells me it's just 3000 hours of walking. So it's really right around the corner. No, but really, I'm really uh, amazed that we can have this talk over this vast distance. And well, I hope that uh, you can take something home from this talk. So I studied physics in Potsdam. Potsdam is uh, right next to Berlin. So Berlin and Potsdam, they are kind of twin cities, you could say. But they are the kind of, of twins that uh, are totally different from each other. Like Potsdam, it's very tidy and beautiful and uh, not so loud. And Berlin, it's big and ugly and a lot of party, very loud. And so the two go together very well, I think. So if you want to, be, um, to uh, have time for yourself, you go to Potsdam. And if you want to party, you go to Berlin. So if you ever have the chance to come here, do it. It's, it's really amazing. Um, so I studied physics in Potsdam, and I think studying physics in Potsdam, it's um, very ordinary. So we have all the ordinary courses that you have, I think, everywhere. But what makes Potsdam uh, really special is that we have a lot of institutes that are concerned with research in the topics of climate and earth science in general. Um, for example, we have the AWI, the Alfred Wegener Institute, we have the PIC, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. We have the Geological Research Institute of Germany. And we have the German Weather Service over here. So it's a lot of earth science and research. Um, especially the AWI had been in the media, at least in Germany, a lot during the last year. Because they staged a really crazy expedition to the North Pole. They went with a ship up there last year in October, I think it was. And they froze themselves into an ice shelf and just went along for one year with this ship in this mosaic expedition and did a lot of crazy measure measurements to understand ice dynamics and the interactions of ice and atmosphere and ocean. So we really have this huge, huge focus on earth science. And um, so I always looked for a possibility to combine physics with something meaningful in, in terms of politics also, in terms of changing the world kind of, and I always thought that doing climate physics would perfectly well combine both, both things actually into one big uh, topic. And I think also climate physics and understanding the climate of the earth, it's uh, more urgent and more pressing actually than ever before. And I think you people in the Philippines, you even understand that better than we over here. I, I understand that some days ago you had the last big typhoon going over the Philippines. So I hope everybody is well, you and your families over there. Um, but, you know, the truth obviously is things are just set to uh, get much worse before they perhaps someday are going to get better. And they only will get better if we start doing something. And it still doesn't look as if we are going to do anything. But so anyway. I wanted uh, to take this chance to tell you some uh, very basic things about the climate, like the three, to talk about the three main ingredients to understand Earth's climate. It's just in, in five minutes, so it's going to be a little two to the force. Um, so I did an internship also at the AWI, where I was had, had the chance to work with a regional climate model. And yeah, so I wanted to tell you something about the climate. And so the main ingredients of the climate are, of course, the sun, the earth and its atmosphere, and actually the earth's rotation, so that it spins around in space. So these three things, with these three things in place, you can understand a lot of uh, Earth's climate already. And for example, to understand the role of the atmosphere on the climate on Earth, 
And you can understand that making a very simple thought experiment and ask yourself what would be the temperature on Earth if there was no atmosphere, for example. And it's a very easy calculation that you can do. It's just three lines of uh, formulas. So you have to use um, some very basic ingredients, like saying, OK, the Earth is a black and an atmosphere which would be 20 degrees. Now, that would be quite cold. Um, and we know it's not so cold. We can measure the temperature on Earth. It's plus 15 degrees. So this difference of uh, 35 degrees, it's all done by the atmosphere. And that's what we call the greenhouse effect. So if anybody tells you greenhouse effect is a hoax or not real, and you can tell them, okay, without greenhouse effect, it would be very cold on Earth. So of course there is greenhouse effect. And how does this greenhouse effect work? Well, I found this really nice um, graphic over here and it shows um, on the left side, which kind of radiation arrives at the Earth, and on the right side, which kind of radiation the Earth sends back into space. And this solid red curve here is what kind of how much radiation actually arrives on the top of the atmosphere of the Earth. And down here, this curve shows you what how much radiation actually arrives on the surface of the Earth. So the difference between the two, um, there must be something happening that uh, not all what's um, coming on to the top of the atmosphere reaches down on Earth. And to understand that, we can, for example, look here at the ultraviolet spectrum. And we see there's a lot of radiation in the ultraviolet spectrum actually arriving at the atmosphere, but it's not coming down to us. And the reason is some stuff that's uh, there in the atmosphere. And this graphic, it uh, shows you different stuff that is present in the atmosphere. For example, water vapor, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and ozone. And now we can look here and we see that ozone actually exactly at the ultraviolet uh, spectrum, it, um, it does uh, uh, scatter a lot of radiation. So ozone is the reason why there's no ultraviolet light coming to Earth. And you know that probably you have perhaps heard of the ozone hole in the atmosphere. So if there's an ozone hole above you, it means there is no ozone and it means a lot of ultraviolet light can come down to you and uh, it can make you really sick. It can give you cancer, skin cancer and other kind of bad stuff. Um, and here on the right side, we can see what kind of radiation goes back from the Earth in, into space. And we see the theoretical curve. This is this solid curve. This is what we would expect to come back without atmosphere. And this is what actually goes back out into, into the space. And so the difference between the two must be um, caused by some other stuff in the atmosphere. We can now look again what stuff is causing this, and we see water vapor has a very huge effect. So all this radiation that is missing here on the right part of the spectrum, it's all because this radiation is absorbed by water vapor, and as second most important contributor, the carbon dioxide. So those things, they actually absorb radiation, and while they absorb radiation, they get hotter and they heat the atmosphere. And so that this is basically what the greenhouse effect is about. It's about stuff in the atmosphere that heats up while it gets irradiated. And now you could look at this graph and say, well, okay, but you see water vapor, it's much more important than carbon dioxide. So what is all the fuss about? But the truth is carbon dioxide is actually very important because there are also feet rate of around 10 kilometers and it's very cold up there. So the air cools down and when it cools down, it will fall down onto the ground again, and then start flowing back. And this air flowing back, this is what we call wind uh, in normal human language. And this together now with the Earth rotation um, gives you, um, I think you all heard about this, the Coriolis effect. So the air is not actually as it is um, drawn here going back in a straight line, but we have those bended lines of wind, the northeasterly and southeasterly, depending on whether you're on the north or south um, side of the Earth. So these are really the basic ingredients of climate physics. So it's rotation, sun, and stuff that we have in the atmosphere. And you see, for example, in this drawing, also the atmosphere, it's much bigger drawn than it actually is. So I think this is where part of the conception comes from that the atmosphere is so big, but it isn't. It's really, probably in this picture, it would be like the white uh, line around my mouse cursor. So this would be probably like the size of the atmosphere if you would draw it, um, really want to draw it. Um, 
Exactly. So um, I did this internship. I did a lot of stuff in, in um, climate physics. And then I had to do my diploma thesis. And my diploma thesis, I didn't go far from, from climate physics to, to write my diploma thesis. I went to chaos and nonlinear dynamics. And of course, chaos and climate physics, they're very um, strongly connected both to each other. Um, first of all, because weather is a chaotic system. And also because the chaos theory and actually derives directly from research into weather. And I, draw, I brought you here the famous experiment by Lawrence, which he made in the 1960s and where he discovered chaos actually. And well, first of all, what's chaos? Chaos in physics is when something depends on, very, very strongly depends on initial conditions you put in there. So that means if you want to describe a system in physics, you know, you have to find some equations that describe all the stuff, and then you have to put in initial conditions, and then you calculate and to see what happens in the future. And chaos tells you, if you just make a little tiny mistake in measuring the initial conditions, you will get very, very different outcomes in your simulation. And that means you cannot really predict anything uh, in the end. Okay, so in this experiment by Lawrence, what he measured, what he did was he had a ring fit um, with a fluid and he heated the stuff from below and he measured the temperature differences between T1 and T3 points and the point T2 and T4. And he measured the velocity of the stuff flowing around in this ring. And then he plotted all this. So he called this temperature differences X, Y, and the velocity he called Z. And then he, he plotted all this against time. And what he got was this really crazy behavior. Um, and if you plot this in phase space, so if you plot the Z axis against X and Y against X, you get this very famous Lorentz attractor. Um, it's this surface where the system moves on. And it's um, like the basic ingredient of chaos that he uh, found here. And okay, now some people say, well, uh, the weather system is chaotic, but then how can you try to, to say what's going to happen in 100 or 1000 years in the climate? It's impossible. And the answer to this is, of course, climate is not weather. And that's a very important point. If we do climate physics, we are not trying to predict the weather. It's a very big difference. Um, and as an example that I came up with, is it's like having a pool in, in the summertime, you have a swimming pool full of uh, jumping children. And predicting the weather would be like predicting what the water in one little edge of the pool is going to do in one hour with all those jumping kids. And predicting the climate, it's like predicting how much water is going to be left after one hour in the pool. So one thing you can probably more or less do. The other thing, it's probably impossible. But it's not, not so bad. We don't want to know what the, the water in one little edge of the pool is doing. We don't really need to. And the climate models are really, really good nowadays also. Um, what, what people do is they uh, actually train the climate models with uh, climate data until, for example, the year 2000. And then they let the models predict what happens the next 20 years, so until now. And the climate models, they are really, really good in predicting what's uh, happening. And the predictions further than 2020 are really bad. So it's going to get a lot warmer and uh, the natural disasters are going to get a lot worse. But OK, so I went um, into the chaos section and my, my diploma thesis was actually um, concerned with a very specific part of this. Um, in research, as always, you only get to do a very specific little thing on something. And I did work on self-sustained oscillators and synchronization. Synchronization is uh, kind of important in, in nonlinear dynamics and oscillators in general. So you can also see this system of Olaf Lorentz as an oscillator, like the fluid is oscillating around and the crazy stuff. So anything is kind of an oscillator. And well, synchronization is uh, the following. So you have a self-sustained oscillator. A self-sustained oscillator is, for example, a pendulum clock like this thing. It's a clock. It has a pendulum that swings around from the left to the right. And it has a motor. So you know, normally things that oscillate, they dissipate energy. So they lose energy all the time because of friction. And so you have to have a motor that, that uh, resupplies this thing with energy all the time so that, does, that it doesn't stop oscillating. It's a self-sustained oscillator kind of is a thing that oscillates only by itself without any outer influence on it. And now you can take two of those oscillators, two pendulum clocks, and you can hang them next to each other on a common support, on a beam, on a 
piece of wood, for example, and then you can look what's going to happen. And this is an actual experiment that Christian Huygens did in the 17th century. Perhaps you know Huygens from um, optics. So he's famous from optics, but he also gave birth to the synchronization theory in physics. So he um, was sick and lying in bed and he watched two pendulum clocks on, on such a wooden thing. And what he found after some time is that they started to swing in unison or enter unison. So they were starting to swing like this after some time. And the reason is because they influence each other over this piece of wood that they are hanging on. So you cannot see it, but this piece of wood that is swinging a little bit. And in the moment when the two clocks swing like this, they minimize this movement of, of uh, their common support. And this is what they want to do and where they're going to tend to go. And this is the reason for synchronization of oscillators. And so if you have self-sustained oscillators um, that always do the same thing all the time, in physics, you can, um, you can make th things like this uh, visible by plotting them on a circle. So, the details are not so important right now, I think, but you can think of this as a little point that is moving on a circle. So the pendulum clock that goes like this all the time, in some way you can think of it as a point going on a circle around and around, always doing the same thing. And each point on the circle um, corresponds to some, some uh, position of the pendulum clock. And so the nice thing about self-sustained oscillators, they always stay on this they don't go away from it. What you know is you can perturb it. You can take the system and put it a little bit away from the circle that is like hitting the clock. You can take the pendulum clock and you can hit it and you can see what it's going to do. It's going to do some crazy stuff. But after some time, it's going to go back to its original movement because it's um, self-sustained. This is what self-sustained means. So it always goes back to this initial movement on the circle. And this is something you can use to uh, greatly simplify uh, the description of such systems. You don't really have to think about the movement that's happening um, away from these circuits. You only have to think about the movement on the circle because the system is going to go back to the circle anyway all the time. And this is what we call synchronization. And um, what I did, what I researched in my diploma thesis. And exactly. And so um, what I researched actually was you have two of those oscillators or more, and they influence each other a little bit. and Influencing each other a little bit will then result in this circle not being a perfect circle, but being kind of deformed. And I made a crazy pictures that look like this. So on the left side, we can see such a circle, which is now a torus, but the torus, it's like two circuits. It's one circle like this and one circle around the torus like, like this. And this is um, the representation of two systems that uh, oscillate. So one system is represented by this big circle and one system by the small circle. And in this case, on the left side, the systems don't influence each other. And then if you switch on that they influence each other, this circle, this um, limit cycle, as it is called, it deforms. And so this is very nice. You can make uh, very complex dynamics visible by uh, watching surfaces. And this is um, what you basically do in, in uh, synchronization theory. And yeah, so. There are many examples also for, for synchronization in nature. And I found this very nice example with your fingers. And this is an experiment you can do now at home, I think. You, you can take your fingers and you can try to move them like this back and forth all the time. And you do this very fast. And what you will find is that you cannot do it. Your fingers will start to move like this after a time. So if you start like this and you do it very fast, your fingers will automatically start moving in anti-phase. And this is because there's, um, your fingers are controlled by certain parts in your brain that are oscillators, self-sustained oscillators, and which influence each other. And they influence each other in this way, in such a way that um, in the end, your fingers get synchronized. And a swing is also a nice example of self-sustained oscillation. Um, and there are many examples. Also uh, fireflies, those little insects that uh, blink all the time. If there are a lot of fireflies together, they will start blinking in synchrony because they influence each other. And there are many, many examples. And one example also is the menstrual cycle, actually. There are researchers that show if there are um, many women in, in a place, like a, was, the experiment was done in a dormitory, and the people showed that the menstrual cycle of people actually tend to synchronize after some time. And so this is now a 
my way to go over to the next topic of my talk to the menstrual cycle, because already while I did my diploma thesis, I started working at the Konrad Suse Institute in Berlin. This is this guy here up here, this Zip. And I started there working on modeling the menstrual cycle. So um, there's a big, big uh, boom in the in the area of life science, which is called life science today. That's like a, bio, a fancy word for biology, actually. And people nowadays also want to understand biological systems with computers. And the idea is to have um, make predictions about how those systems gonna evolve. And, um, so one of those systems we wanted to understand was the menstrual cycle. And just very fast, Conrad Suse is this guy on the right here, and he was one of the um, one of those who invented one of the first computers, the Z3 in the 40th, I think it was. So the institute is named after this guy. And the project I was working on was called Peon. And so why exactly would we want to uh, model the menstrual cycle? Well, the answer, answer is that um, it has to do with infertility treatment. So the menstrual cycle is a very, very complex thing, actually. And um, if people are infertile, so they cannot get children, half of those infertility-related diseases happen with women and half with men. And from the women side, um, I think one fifth of all infertility diseases are related to problems with the menstrual cycle, so that things are not really adding up there. Um, so it's for many people important to understand what's going on in the menstrual cycle. And we worked very closely together with the doctors who um, treated women for uh, menstrual cycle related problems. And if you talk to those doctors privately, they're gonna admit to you that actually what they do is trial and error. They don't really understand what is the menstrual cycle doing. They just have a lot of experience in administering certain drugs. And sometimes it works to um, get a woman pregnant by administering such drugs, and sometimes it doesn't. And they don't really know when it does work and when not. So um, understanding the menstrual cycle, it's kind of important. Um, and well, as I said, it's a very complex thing, and I'll just give you a very brief introduction on it. So there are different parts of the body um, in the play, in, in play at the menstrual cycle. We have the ovaries, where the follicles are, are staying. Follicles are little. Um, little cells that in their middle have the egg, actually, the uh, egg that wants to get fertilized. So these things, the follicles, they are in the ovaries and they produce hormones, for example, estradiol, that is E2, or progesterone, P4. And so this stuff, these hormones, they go back to the brain, to the hypothalamus and pituitary, which are the most important uh, parts of the brain uh, involved in the menstrual cycle. And there they're gonna um, lead to the production of other hormones, for example, FSH or LH, which in turn, again, influence the ovaries and the follicles. So it's a complex system that we have there. And the model we uh, were working with at the tip was even more complicated. It was very, very huge with a lot of um, dependencies. And I was, based, I was uh, in charge, you could say, of developing the model for the follicles, really for the follicles, for the, the development of them. And because of the funny thing about follicles is the following. Um, you probably know uh, women get, when they um, ovulate, it's usually one egg that uh, gets ready to be, um, that, that is getting ready in ovulation. But at the beginning of the month, there's always a whole bunch of follicles starting to grow. So it's typically 15 follicles that start growing in the beginning of a month. And at the end of the month, you only get one egg. So something is happening in between uh, this. There's some, something happening. And we wanted to understand what this something actually is. And I did a lot of, uh, lot of talks about uh, the menstrual cycle also in Germany. So I have this uh, crazy drawings already that I'm going to use. And I'm sorry, the, the words are in German, but I'm going to um, I'm going to translate it. So this is a follicle as I draw it. It's a, the little uh, thing with the egg inside. So this white guy is the egg. And around this are other cells that uh, form this follicle. And uh, a woman has a lot of dormant follicles. You call it a reservoir. So when a, a woman gets born, it's around 400,000 dormant follicles. And each month, a uh, number of them gets, we call it recruited. So it's like they go to war. It's like recruiting uh, for liquid. So they get activated. They wake up and they start growing, growing, growing. And they get a lot of, they get uh, blood. Um, 
vessels and they get a lot of layers of cells that grow around them and they get really huge. They um, start at a size of under a millimeter and I think they go up to uh, one centimeter are the biggest ones in the end. So they grow really big and this um, big follicles, they are called a cohort of follicles. And now this cohort starts interacting with each other. And well, in the moment when they start growing, they um, start being dependent on a hormone called FSH. It's like their food. So it's footer in German, it's their food. This is the FSH hormone. And the follicles now need this hormone to grow and to survive. And the interaction now looks like this. The follicles will start also to, to poison uh, the other follicles around them. They release some toxic uh, substances that will hinder the other follicles on growing. So this is one way they interact with each other. And the other way is by producing so-called inhibitors, uh, also hormones that wander back into the, into the brain. And because this, this food that they get, the FSH hormone, this comes from the brain actually. And so the follicles produce another hormone which goes to the brain and which kind of closes the tap of the FSH hormone. So the bigger an, a follicle is, the more it wants to close the FSH for the other hormones. And the fun thing being that the, biggest, the bigger the follicle is, the less it is also dependent on this FSH hormone. So the bigger follicle will start to, to close this uh, FSH tip. And what it then happens is the bigger follicle gets bigger and bigger, while there is less and less of uh, the food there. And that means that the other follicles that are around are going to die because they are not big enough. They still very much depend on the FSH hormone. And if it's not there, they're going to die. And so this is more or less the basic ingredients of the hormonal, of, of the competition of follicles. In the end of this process, you have one follicle, one very big follicle, and then another hormone comes along, which is called LH, which comes along once a month in, in a healthy human cycle, menstrual cycle. And this hormone then um, brings the will uh, the, the follicle will break up when this hormone is there and release the egg. So this is the ovulation. Then the sperm can come around and you can get children if you're lucky. And so all this process from the cohort to the ovulation, it's stable. It's a very stable process normally. And so you can try to model it to actually find equations to um, try to describe this process and to, to understand what influences the process. And so this is what I did. I came up with some equation describing this process. It was kind of complicated. You had a lot of parameters, like the minimal and maximal size. You had some constant that was describing the competition or the growth rate of the follicles. And then the, um, the nice thing about this equation is was we could um, determine how many follicles would actually emerge after one cycle. So as I said, normally it's one follicle that are gonna be ovulating in the end. But in uh, unhealthy cycles, there can also be more follicles, there can be no follicles. It very much depends. And so with this equation, and uh, we could also mathematically prove that this was possible with this equation, with this, um, yeah, with this equation. And so that was a nice thing. And so what we then had to do was to find um, all those parameters that are in there. And parameter search is a very nasty thing. You need a lot of time and uh, patience for it. But um, after doing it, we found a, right, a very nice model and I brought you some curves of the hormones. This is estradiol, for example, during one menstrual cycle. This is FSH, the, the um, food of the, uh, of the follicles. And this is LH, which got one peak during the menstrual cycle, which um, indicates the ovulation. So the red circle is the ovulation, the time of ovulation in the cycle and the red uh, arrow shows you where the red phase of the menstrual cycle begins, so the, the blooding actually. And down here we have um, the, the follicle model. So um, in the beginning of the menstrual cycle, we have a lot of follicles starting to grow and then all but one follicle die, and just one follicle ovulates. But we can also make it three follicles with this equation. And so this was um, a very nice, nice thing to have. Um, but still, I was very skeptical about all this stuff, um, mainly because in the whole big menstrual cycle model, we had um, more or less like 90 parameters to fix it. And most of these parameters are impossible to measure. And so what you, it, what you can do with a model with a lot of parameters actually is everything. So if you have enough parameters in a model, you can show everything, no matter what. 
And if you can show everything with a model, it's not really worth so much. Um, and this is a big problem, I think, that there is around today also in life science and generally with um, modeling stuff. You should not believe every simulation that you see. I think this is a good take home message from this part because models always have to be first reproducible and they have to be falsifiable. And if the model is big enough to do anything, you can never falsify it. So it will ever always look as if it was true, but it will not be able to tell you really a lot um, about the, the uh, real world. So this is a big problem. And so I came out of the menstrual cycle modeling a little bit um, not so happy. And I was thinking, I want to go back to physics and do something that you can actually prove and disprove. And so I started my PhD thesis. Ah, yeah, um, there I, I just remember, but, um, I wanted to say to the introduction, um, I'm not really a doctor yet. I'm doing my PhD still, so I'm not uh, a doctor, but I'm hopefully going to be in, in some month. Um, yeah, I'm doing my PhD right now at the HZB at the Helmholtz Center in Berlin. And at this place here on the left, this is the BESI, it's the Berlin Electron Synchrotron. And what it, this is, uh, this is what it looks like from the inside. So a lot of uh, crazy technique lying around there. And what this thing does is producing X-ray radiation, so-called synchrotron radiation which is a special, very special kind of X-rays. It, um, circuiton radiation is, is nice because it is X-ray radiation with all kinds of frequencies. So what you call this is white X-ray uh, beams. From the inside, uh, the, the Bessie looks like this. You have a wing where the electrons are flying around and they get um, accelerated all the time by big magnets that lie in there. And so they, they, they fly around and they get bended. And this bending um, is, as you probably know, is an acceleration. And electrons getting accelerated, they tend to emit radiation, so-called X-ray radiation. And um, in, in this kind of setup, what you can then do is really have all kinds of frequencies into this uh, X-ray radiation. Normally, if you make X-ray radiation, like as, for example, the doctor does, um, what you do normally is, uh, you just have electrons hitting some target, and while hitting the target, they will emit X-ray radiation, but only a very specific frequencies, depending on what kind of target you use and a lot of details. But in this kind of setup at the Bessim, you can get a big, big range of, of uh, frequencies. And this is a cool thing because of the following. What you want to do with this radiation is you want to look into materials and perhaps you know that it's uh, looking into materials with x-ray radiation works more or less like the following you have um, a crystalline material so these points here are atoms on a crystal lattice they have uh, very specific um, distances between um, between them and now you shine x-ray radiation onto the crystal and what happens is this radiation gets uh, gets reflected by uh, the crystal lattice but only very specific frequencies uh, get diffracted. Sorry, not reflected, but diffracted. Very specific frequencies only get diffracted depending on the distance of those lattice planes and on, depending on the angle of the light and depending on the frequency of the light. So normally what you have to do if you only have one frequency of X-ray light is um, what you want to do actually is you want to find out those distances of the atom planes. So looking into material, is understanding what those distances between the atoms are. Then you can have some um, idea of what the crystal lattice actually looks like. So you want to get those distances. And where there's a very special relation between the distances and the angles and everything, that's the Bragg relation, you probably know that. And if you only have one frequency, what you have to do is you have to, um, you have to rotate your sample all the time. So you have an incident beam of light and you have to rotate your sample all the time to see at which angle actually is there gonna be a reflex? Is there gonna be some uh, diffraction of X-ray? And at this angle, this angle then tells you the distance of the atomic planes. And now the nice thing with synchrotron radiation is you have all kinds of frequencies in the light you are shining onto the material uh, at once at the same time. And so what you then you don't have to uh, rotate your sample anymore. You just have your sample lying there shining all the x-ray radiation onto it 
and immediately you get all the reflexes that tell you how the stuff looks from uh, the inside. And this is called energy dispersive X-ray diffraction that we do. And here I've, I have a little um, um, drawing of how X, EDXRD, as we call it, looks like. So we have the right X-ray beam shining onto some sample. Um, in our case, it's uh, solar sets. I'm going to come to this. It's shining onto the sample, and you have some detector, and everything is standing still, so you have, don't have to move anything, and you will get um, reflexes of the radiation uh, that correspond to what the material in the inside looks like uh, immediately without having to do anything else. So it's a really, really nice technique that you can do to look what's going on. And so we are doing this stuff with uh, solar cells, um, especially with CIGS solar cells. So that is solar cell cells that consist of copper, indium, gallium, and selenide. And they are very thin. So the basic uh, difference between CIGS and normal solar cells made out of silicon, I'd say, is that they can be very th thin, the CIGS stuff, in the order of some micrometers. And this is because they um, are direct band gaps material, band gap materials, which means that uh, they can easily, th that light can easily be converted into electric current in them. In, um, you only need light and an atom to do that. In silicon, you need light, an atom, and uh, a vibration, actually, a phonon to do the same stuff, which is much more unlikely to happen. That's why you need much bigger silicon, well, not big like this, but you need a thicker silicon solar cells than CAGS stuff. So um, a full solar cell looks more or less like this, but I'm only uh, concerned actually with this CIGS stuff here in the middle. So on top you can have some, uh, you need to have some conducting material, you need to have some glass on top, you need to have some glass um, underneath of the actual absorber material also. But I'm not really interested in all this stuff. I'm only interested actually in the CIGS absorber material here in the middle. That's the stuff that really takes photons and makes electricity out of them. And so we, uh, so um, here I have a unit cell of CIGS of copper, indium, gallium, selenite, and it's, uh, so it's a crystalline material, of course. And so we can use the synchrotron radiation very nicely to see how it looks like. And so what we do is we we watch it while it gets formed. And forming is um, such an absorber layer is done like this. You have some glass substrate, and on top you put indium, copper, and gallium, and indium again in different layers. You stack them all up and then you put all of this stuff into an oven with selenium this is the selenium and you heat it up you heat just heat it to 600 degrees you wait some minutes and then the magic happens and the solar cell forms and what actually forms is well, you would expect to to have formed a homogeneous layer um, a homogeneous layer of all the stuff, but what actually forms is you get two distinct layers after heating. You get on um, on the back contact, you get all the gallium, and on the front, you get all the indium. This is what we see when we do the experiment. And then the indium and the gallium, they start to diffuse, to interchange places. And this is very strange. What you would actually expect is really to get a homogeneous uh, layer, but you don't get it. And so my uh, PhD research is actually trying to understand why this uh, is happening like this. And here I brought you some measurements showing uh, the elemental distribution of such a solar cell. So here we have the back and here we have the front. And you see all the gallium here is in the back while all the indium is in the front. And actually you would like to have it all intermixed. And so we do go and put it into an oven and we do measurements and we get um, EDXID measurements look like this. So we get graphs like this. Down here you have the time. And this is the photon energy, so the X-ray energy that comes back to your detector. And all those lines that um, are here, each line um, corresponds to some phase inside the material, so to some specific distance of atomic planes inside the material. So you can, when you look at this, you can really um, understand what's happening inside the solar cell. For example, there are some lines appearing at some time, and there are some lines disappearing also at some times. And so there's a lot of stuff going on while the solar cell forms. And actually, when these two lines over here, you, you see very barely, when they appear, we know the process is done. So the indium solar cell is fed, this is done, the CIGS solar cell. 
And we can zoom in onto those lines, onto those two, those two lines. And what we see is uh, this. So we see one reflex of the copper indium deselenite stuff that's on the top of the solar cell that's coming from there. This is this line down here. And we see one uh, that comes from the gallium uh, stuff that's on the back of the solar cells. And we can now see what they do. And that's what I'm um, trying to explain. Like, what we would like to help, as I said, is that the two things interdiffuse and intermix. And if they would intermix those two lines, they would uh, they would converge onto each other. You would only have in the end one line, but this is not what's happening. The two lines, they stay distinct because this diffusion process somehow stops. And um, I already uh, have talked a lot. I don't know, I need some five minutes. Is that okay or should I? Yeah, okay. So. Um, we try to understand this, and uh, the way to understand this is the following, or as I would like to explain it, is the following. Um, you have those two different faces, and if we now look at a thin layer um, right here at the border of the two faces, we can uh, draw it like this. So this is the layer, and the black dots are the gallium atoms. So this is the kappa gallium deselenite um, face, and we are only interested in the gallium. So these black dots are the gallium atoms, and now an indium atom comes from the top, from here. And now the indium is bigger than the gallium. And so when the indium goes into this layer and a gallium goes out of the layer, the layer wants to get thicker because the indium is bigger. So the layer wants to get big again. But the problem is we have a substrate. We have a very, very thick substrate on top of which all this stuff is deposited. And because of the substrate, the layer cannot expand. So the layer wants to expand, but it cannot. And this is like thinking about it, like pressing it together again. And pressing something together, um, it's called applying a stress, a mechanical stress. And so we think that this is what's happening. So we have the um, development of mechanical stresses inside the solar cell. And this means that the indium atoms, they need more energy to um, come here, to come into the gallium layer and interchange with the gallium atoms. And so if you have more and more stress forming, this process of diffusion, of interchanging of gallium and indium will just stop at some point. And we think that this is the explanation why um, we don't see a total homogeneization of all this stuff. And uh, this is another way to think about it. So we had to make a lot of drawings of this to convince the reviewers to accept our paper. So I have a lot of <laughs> drawings showing this thing. So we have big indium atoms again and small gallium atoms and we interchange the two. Then the indium phase wants to get smaller, the gallium phase wants to get bigger, but they are both stuck together. And so the whole thing would want to bend actually, but it's on a substrate, it can't bend. So you have to uh, bend it back that it looks like in the beginning. And what you have to do then is you have to apply stresses, these sigmas. So you have a lot of stress and that stops the interdiffusion. And so I came up with a numerical models describing all this stuff. Here I brought you the same measurement of the, um, this is actually, ah, yeah, this, these lines, but only the peak position. So only the black dots are shown. Uh, this is what we see here. So these uh, dots are the measurement points of the uh, kappa gallium deselenite phase and here of the kappa indium deselenite phase. And those other curves, the blue curves are the simulations. And so if you, for example, just try to explain this process by normal diffusion, that's called Fickian diffusion, what you get is these red curves. So you get a really bad um, plot, a really bad, uh, it doesn't really work like this. You see that you, the both, two, both lines start to converge to each other in the model, which is not happening. But if you um, start to think about stress and put stress into the model, you can fit the data much more nicely. And uh, so, yeah, that looks really good. And down here we have um, the gallium distribution throughout the um, cell at different times. So this is the back contact, this is the front in this uh, graph. And in the beginning, we have a lot of gallium here at the back. And with time going by, this gallium gets less and less and more and more in the front, less and less in the back. And then we have some uh, configuration, some stable final configuration that is not homogeneous. We still have a big gradient, a lot of gallium in one part and a lot of indium in the other. So yeah, that's what I did for my, what I do for my PhD. And all in all, I think um, 
with some analytical understanding and some programming skill, I think programming is very important. So if you get the chance, learn programming, at least one language, because they are all the same in the end. So just pick one that you'd like very much and get very good at it. And it will help you a lot. Like it helped me a lot at least. And with programming and analytical understanding, you can do so many things. It's uh, really amazing. And I love this job. Uh, that's why I love doing physics. And uh, yeah, in the end, I have uh, some pictures showing that I'm a really bad experimentalist. So here's when I blew up our oven, actually, during our beam time. <laughs> so this is how it's supposed to look. And this is how it looked after I uh, worked there. So yeah, I'm better doing theory, I think, than anything else. OK, thanks for your attention. That's that's it then. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Uh, soon to be Dr. Stefan Jafer. <laughs> By the way, my name is Professor Neil Asta, and um, I'm from Mindanao State University, Iligan Institute of Technology. And um, my role is to be the moderator for the Q&A portion. Um, I must say that we are privileged to have you here with us. Uh, thank you for sharing your research and your experience. If I remember correctly, you talked about three major things. You talked about like the chaos in our weather, uh, I mean, our climate, and you like also talked about, next thing you talk about, I guess, is, no, I'm gonna have to go back on that because I think I forgot. <laughs> but the last one is this um, trying to understand what happens when you were trying to fabricate uh, a solar cell, I guess. And um, all right, I'm sure I remember the second one, but now that I'm on the spot, I kind of forgot. <laughs> but anyway, the menstrual cycle stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 the menstrual <laughs> cycle, yeah, yeah, trying to understand the menstrual cycle. <laughs> And um, I must say before I ask the audience for their questions that um, you really showed your expertise because you make it sound so easy, uh, which we all know is not. <laughs> you really understand your craft. And really, that's really amazing that while I was listening to you, um, I understood everything, which that's nice. <laughs> at least the basic, that's, it's amazing. And anyway, um, Let's go to the questions now. Um, I would like to encourage the participants to, to ask your questions through the chat box and I will read them for you. But now we will also take some time to allow you to ask questions through microphone. So if you want to ask questions through the microphone, you may click the raise hand icon. And uh, when we acknowledge you, we will unmute your microphone. Okay, so is there anybody I would like to ask by raising their hand. I'm not sure if I can see the hands. So I'm gonna ask, need help from my friend Adele if she can see. Oh, I think somebody raised his hand. Von Philip Perez. Okay, Von. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. May, may, uh, may I ask about the formula that you discussed earlier? Because I want to analyze it. The formula. Uh, the formula for the menstrual cycle. Because I cannot understand. For, for the menstrual cycle, you mean? Yes. Okay, <laughs> let me just share the screen again. <laughs> Um, so I think you mean this one? Yes, that, that one, yeah. Yeah, so on the left side, uh, the X, it's uh, the size of the follicle in millimeters. And so we have the derivative of uh, the time derivative of the size. So we want to understand how, sorry, how the size of the follicle is changing over time. And it's changing by some growth, uh, it has some constant growth factor. So we assume it is, um, if nothing else happens, it's uh, constantly growing. Then we have an H plus function. It's um, that's like a switch function um, that depends, this function depends on the FSH, that is the uh, food hormone, the hormone the follicle needs to grow. And it depends on some um, 
sensitivity. And what this H plus actually then says is only if the FSH, the, the food concentration is above some threshold, only then this function uh, is one. And so in, in all other cases, this function is zero. So this means only if there's enough food there, the follicle will actually grow. If there is too little food, there is no growth and the follicle will die. So then again, we have um, the size of the follicle in here, xi. So the growth is proportional to the size of the follicle. The bigger it is, the faster it's going to grow. And uh, we have put in some minimal and maximal size of the follicle. So we know follicles can't get bigger than, uh, I think it's like five millimeters. I, I'm not sure right now what the actual number was, but so we want to um, ensure that the follicle will not get any bigger. Yes. And this last factor here, uh, this factor is the competition. So it depends on the size of all the other follicles and some uh, competition constant. And so the bigger the other follicles are, the, the smaller this term becomes. And so the smaller all of uh, the growth rate becomes for the follicle, which is to say, the bigger the other follicles are, the worse is their effect on the growth of this specific follicle. So all the other follicles, they influence um, the growth of each other in a, in a as I said, in a uh, bad way. So they try to inhibit the growth of, of each other. That's the competition we try to put in there. So yeah, that's basically the, the meaning of this formula. And so this C, this competition constant, it really determines how many follicles are gonna be um, ovulating. The bigger it is, uh, the the how is it? The uh, bigger it is, the more follicles are gonna ovulate in this case. Yeah. Okay, I okay. Thank you. Um, does anybody else want to ask a question by raising their hand? While we wait, I can read some of the questions here in the chat. Matthew Danuel Herrera asks, Hello po. So aside from the solar cells made out of CIGS being thin, does it also mean it is also as efficient or more efficient than current cells? Um. The CIGS is uh, very efficient indeed already. Um, it's not as efficient as silicon solar cells though. I think with CIGS, we are now at an efficiency of 23% more or less. Um, and with silicon, it's a little bit more, but I don't really have uh, the detailed numbers in, uh, in memory right now. But yeah, they are very efficient. And, but one of the problems also that you have with CIGS Although it is very thin, what you have in there is indium and gallium, and indium and gallium are very, uh, 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 how is it called? It's, um, it's stuff that is not very abundant. So it's very seldom, I think seldom earth is the word, I'm not sure. So it's not very abundant. And so although it is thin, you have to use stuff that you can hardly find. So it's kind of a trade-off and yeah, being thin is not all to the equation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Dello asks, in the menstrual cycle part, you show the equation describing its dynamics. Is it purely a first order ODE? If yes, did you already study the stability condition, like finding fixed points, or is stability condition relevant to the analysis of the system? Thanks. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. It's it's a first order uh, model. So um, I showed you the, the big model. So they have a lot of components in here and they all um, are described by first order time derivatives and they're all influencing each other. We have um, all in all, it was kind of like 20 components or so depending and plus all the follicles. So each follicle was also a component. So you had in the end like 40 components or something. And so it's very huge and the stability analysis is um, kind of impossible. 
And as I said, we also have like 90 parameters. So really what you have to do is uh, parameter search and you have, there are ways to efficiently search parameter spaces, even such big ones, um, but they are still um, inefficient. And it's a big trial and error actually. And this is one of the, the things that really annoyed me also. You, you don't, um, with so many, as I said, with so many parameters and so many equations, you can basically do anything. The parameter space is very big. You can make it do anything. And so reproducibility is, uh, it's not really clear <laughs> what this model actually tells you about the real world. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So Jan Delos, thanks you for your response. Well, somebody asked me privately um this is this one is um not within your topic but it's um it says a lot of the participants here are college students so what advice can you give them um yeah i think one very good advice that served me yes. very well was uh was learning to to program actually and to be open minded on on what you uh, can do with physics. Like really, I, I taught programming to myself when I was still in high school actually, and it served me really well. I didn't know back then that it would be such a good idea to learn programming, but now I know that it was a really good idea because in every job I did since then I had to program a lot, and, and so yeah, this is. Uh, a big advice I can give you just uh, take the time learn some programming language perhaps do some little uh, um, numeric experiments you can find a lot of scripts on the internet telling you how to uh, simulate physical systems and it's a big fun you can you get to really uh, show on the computer um, you can really bring the computer to simulate the real world and I think that's a really cool thing uh, to do to get uh, nice graphs that uh, show you how the real world works in the end. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So does anybody else want to ask a question by raising their hand or by... So while waiting, I, um, can I ask a question, Nadel? I have a question. Um, I'm really a high school teacher. So this one is uh, related to being a high school teacher and um, we have this misconception in the Philippines. I don't know if I can uh, say for everyone else, but you know, biology is easy because all you do is memorize facts. And I think that's a misconception because the way you present the topics right now, um, you're doing a lot of numerical analysis and you're really trying to understand. It's, it, it just looks complicated. So would you agree that biology in a sense is not just about memorizing facts yeah totally I, I would even say biology is much more complicated than physics and the reason for that is because um, in physics what you always want to do if you want to understand something um, you have a big system like the climate for example and and you want to understand the climate then what you can do is you go into the lab and you build a little climate for example, you have, um, as Lawrence did, you have this ring of fluid and you heat it and you look what's happening. So in physics, you can always try to break up your big systems into very small things. And then you can try to understand those small things and then try to draw conclusions. But in biology, it doesn't work like this. You cannot uh, take a woman to understand the menstrual cycle and kind of slice it up into little parts and try to understand those little parts. It just doesn't work. You have to take the whole thing and you have to understand the whole thing and there's nothing um, that helps you with this actually but trial and error and so this complexity of biology and makes it really really hard to understand i think and we are far from understanding anything in biology actually it's the memorizing part it's uh, just the phenomenological description i would say of what's happening but really understanding why stuff is happening um, we are at the very beginning I think, in biology, in life science in general. And also trying to, to influence uh, biological processes. As I said, the, our goal was to un 
understand how women could be treated if they have menstrual cycle related diseases. So we want to really predict biological systems and uh, we, we just can't. It's too complex, it's too complicated. And I think um, a prediction of me, we will not be able for many years to come to predict uh, any feasible biological thing that's happening out there. Okay, so we're down to our last question. So does anybody, oh, somebody asked. So my friend, Sir Alvin Bello. Hi, is your solar cell design easy to mass produce? So Sir Bello is asking if your solar cell design, the one with gallium and indium, is it easy to mass produce at lower costs? Uh, it, it is already mass produced at low cost. So okay. if it's easy, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> As I said, I'm more the theory guy, but um, I think it's, it's not, well, it's done already. You can do it and it's at low cost also. You can produce it at low cost. Um, I think the main problem that it's not done as much as we would need it to be produced is uh, not a technical issue, but a political issue, really it is. In Germany, for example, just to give you an example, um, we had, we used to have a big industry of this thin film solar cell stuff, um, mm. but because the politics decided it's not worth uh, funding these kind of things, they all crashed and they were all bought off by big companies, by big Chinese companies which is not a bad thing at all, but um, now the, all the stuff is not produced anymore in Germany, which is a bad thing. And so it's all going somewhere else. And I think so that it's not done as much as we would like to have it in Germany. It's a political problem, but it's not a technical thing. So yeah, you can, you can produce all this thin film technologies and it is produced in industrial scale, on industrial scales already. Okay, thank you. So what do you think is the best solar cell ma material, someone asked? What, <laughs> I guess in terms of efficiency and reproducibility. Well, um, as I said, I'm not so much the, the technical guy. So this question is kind of hard to answer for me. I think there is, well, the obvious answer is there is no best material probably. You always have pros and cons for the different materials depending on where you want to use them for say IGS, for example, because it's so thin, you can uh, make it flexible, very flexible. So um, I have this one picture here of the, here of the CIGS, so let's say on a flexible substrate. So you can, could think of very crazy uh, applications for this to you can put it on, I don't know, on clothes, on, on anything actually, and uh, it could produce energy. So that's, that would be really cool. But, and you can do this with silicon. But you can do probably other stuff with silicon that you can do with CLGS. But I think Adele is there more the expert than I am actually on this question. So. Okay, so that ends our Q&A session. Can we give a virtual round of applause to our speaker? <laughs> Thanks. <man. laughs> we apologize if we can't accommodate all your other questions, but we will take note of them and try to address them after the session through emails. Again, thank you so much. And uh, now turn this over to our host, Rhea. Um, thank you, Dr. Stefan, for such an interesting fun talk. And also Professor Neil Lassa for moderating the session. Can you give them a virtual round of applause, please? So at this juncture, I'd like to call on Mr. Henry Joshua Sagman, President of the Science Educators Guild of Caraga State University, to give the response speech. Henry. Hello, good day, Sir Stefan. Hello. And I would just like to first say, say that thank you for speaking to us today. We all know that your time is very precious. You are, after all, a renowned scientist. When we first heard that you're going to talk to us, we quickly discovered in Google Scholar that yes. you've, you've published multiple papers and it took multiple Google Scholar pages in order to contain all of your published work. And I would just like to say, wow. Amen. And I would like to say thank you for giving us your precious time. And I would like to put in simple words that your talk was awesome. 
you were able to take fairly complicated topics like climate physics, chaos, and menstrual cycle into things that is very understandable and very enjoyable and which made us very interested towards the topic, even though it was unfamiliar to us. I mean, we're undergraduates and we're learning about chaos. And it was very, very, it was very, very fun. And it was also very, very rele- relevant. And I would also like to thank you for proving to us that people, human activities does have an effect towards the atmosphere. I mean, to all of those anti-climate people out there, I mean, we just need to look at the lives lost in Typhoon Haiyan and Typhoon Rolly and Typhoon Yosas. And we've just had like three typhoons in a month. Something must be wrong. And thank you for proving to us and thank you for saying to us that we need to actually change because it all will only get actually worse. And Mom Adele was actually right. We do see glimpses of the great Dr. Richard Feynman in you because, because I think we can all agree here that we want to be like Mr. Sifan that can be able to explain and be enthusiastic in science and make students fall in love with the subject even though it's very, very hard. And as a future science educator and all of the scientists out here, one of our goals is to ensure that there will be more people and there will be more brain power in the next generation answering our problems and answering problems in science. And you, Mr. Sifon, is the reason why the scientific community and the physics community is actually expanding and growing because you have a certain love and enthusiasm for a subject that people actually want to actually inherit. We need more people like you in the Philippines because in the Philippines, people tend to have a stereotype that when you go to a physics program, you need to be a genius. You need to be a methodology. You need to be all of these kind of things that you need to be very serious. But you gave us a glimpse of what a physicist should be. It should be fun. It should be inclusive. And a physicist can also make mistakes like blowing up an experiment. And if... And if people were to meet like you and people and students and meet people like you and scientists like you, I think their doubts about whether they should actually go to physics would, be disappe- would disappear because their passion and love for the subject would actually prevail compared to their fears. And I would just like to say that, say that thank you for proving to our students because they, we have senior high school students here and high school students. And I have a gut feeling that towards the students that are actually doubting, their doubts have disappeared because they feel assured that when they go to a physics program and a physics degree, they can do anything like what you've said. And thank you. Thank you so much. So, so thank you, Henry, for that wonderful speech. And um, Victor, Stefan, would you like to say some final words before we close our session? Um, yeah, uh, I hope you enjoyed my talk and I hope you can take uh, some key messages home and yeah, don't be afraid of uh, doing crazy things. It can only uh, be good for you. <laughs> Have fun in what you do. We now welcome Professor Bien Butanas, the chair of the physics department of the, of the CMU for his closing remarks. Hi, um, thank you, Ria. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to uh, thank everyone for uh, joining us this afternoon. Especially, I'd like to thank uh, future, future uh, PhD holder uh, Stefan Schaeffer for for the very wonderful uh, topic. Uh, you see, um, physics and biology is somewhat uh, a distant branch in science. But then, uh, when I look at the when I look at how uh, uh, Mr. Stefan presented the the topics on on menstrual cycle and then that uh made me realize that it's it's not really that that simple menstrual cycle is not that uh easy to to model so 
but then but then the explanations of the dynamics as to how complicated it is and some parameters that needs to be understand and able to to uh, uh, to fully fully describe the evolution of a certain certain uh, growth of a poly follicle is somewhat somewhat really uh, uh, nice to hear. And then of course, I agree that I agree to uh, Sir Neil that uh, Mr. Stefan made it easy for us to understand the concepts about about uh, solar solar cells, the interaction between the interface of this uh, growth of the two uh, uh, two uh, uh, compounds. So I, I'm not I'm not I'm not really uh, I'm not really sure if 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 later on uh, Mr. Stefan would uh, uh, would would be uh, able to defend or I, I don't know what happened to to the paper I think it's already it's already being uh, uh, published because uh, he he wanted to describe uh, the dynamics in in the interface so what happens if if this to wafer actually uh, uh, mixed. So, but then in, in the experiment, so we, we've noticed that the, the, the two did not actually uh, meet. So that's why he made some modeling as to what, what will happen when, uh, when this two, uh, when these two uh, compounds are actually uh, mixing with, so that's why I, I I hope that later on uh, uh, he will uh, he will be able to to uh, uh, publish this uh, results, and then also um, chaos is not that 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 simple, but then uh, uh, I've I've learned from from him that you know um, climate is somewhat for me climate is somewhat somewhat uh it's it's closely related with 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 weather so that's why somewhat uh i can i can always interchange this this two two word uh two uh two uh how do you call this uh quantity uh climate and and weather but then but then mr stefan told uh, uh told us that climate is not it's not it's not weather it's not a weather so that's why uh that 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 gives me something, and I hope that the students which joined us today have learned something, and then and then I hope that they were inspired. They are inspired by by the way how science and in particular physics can can go into, and and in fact we now we now witness how physics tries to explain. The concepts of biology, and then when physics tries to to dive into biology, everything everything becomes complicated. We thought that it is simple, but then but then we now witness that 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 menstrual cycle. When when this was explained, when this is explained in terms of 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 physics, and this becomes becomes uh, complicated. Just like when I learned about photosynthesis, when I studied photosynthesis before. So I, I thought photosynthesis is, is, is easy, but then when we try to uh, use the concept of quantum mechanics and try to explain photosynthesis, everything becomes becomes complicated. So now there, as mentioned also, there are so many things that can be done, re-explaining, uh, re-studying uh, the things that we have learned in in biology using the language of physics. So that I hope I hope our participants today will will uh, contribute in in those fields on the things that that we can do in in, in the future. So thank you so much, uh, especially to the various partners. So uh, I have to I have to mention uh, them. We have the Pinoy scientists, Bukidnon Physics Society, the Earth Shaker, the CMU Physics Society, Takapisanan ng mga mag-aaral sa Pisika, the CMU Science Education Society. We have also the Caraga State University Physics Department. 
the Science Educators Guild, Caraga State University Main Campus, the USTP Physics Department, the Applied Physics Sciences Society, WIMSU Physics Student Society, the Society of Physics Students, uh, the Einstein Society of PNU Mindanao. So thank you so much for your uh, for your uh, for your help in in the in the uh, um, in the process of 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 uh, how do you, how do how should I say this um, helping us facilitate this. Uh, this uh, meet up so so for me uh, seeing Rhea and Henry uh, joining us is, is, is really a, 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 a big thing so I hope others will also uh, uh, help us in the in the future meetup so that would be all thank you so much thank you so much professor Bien for that wonderful speech that ends the first part of the physics meetup. We would like to invite everyone to open their cameras if you're comfortable for a group picture. We will have three poses. So everyone turn on your cameras and smile. <laughs> um, at the end, are we good for poses? So let's start in three, two, one, pose. <laughs> And another post in three, two, one. And last one, po. Three, two, one. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, um, thank you so much, Rhea. Can we give Rhea a round of applause? Um, I'd just like to introduce Rhea. Um, Rhea, she's the president of the student Phys uh, Society of Physics Students at Caraga State University in Butuan. So thank you so much, Rhea, and to all those who, who helped prepare this um, session. And uh, of course, I'd like to thank um, Stefan. Thank you so much for, for joining us. It's very early in the morning in Germany, but um, you are here and you graced us uh, with your presence and also your expertise. And we just want to, to, to mention that one of the things that motivated us to come up with this idea of physics meetup is really to, to connect everyone, especially students in the rural areas of, for example, Bukidnon, to meet real life physicists. So what we want them to experience that kind of um, opportunity for them to, to really have that, not really an icon, but an example of what a physicist looks like. So, you know, they are not really that serious type, they are fun loving, and um, we are not really boxing them into the kind of stereotype that they are. So we thank you again, Stefan, for, for, for such a, Warm, uh, warm presence. So um, here we come to the second part, and this is the networking. We, we know that physics meetup is not only about connecting everyone to a certain, a global expert, but also to connect everyone, especially students, to the different student organizations and students in uh, Mindanao. So we would like to invite you to join us, if you are still free, to join us in the networking. And hopefully, Stefan also can join some of the rooms so that he can just say hi and um, introduce you, um, introduce the participants to him, him also. So thank you so much. Um, I just want to mention that there will be 11 rooms. I will be dividing you all to 11 breakout rooms. So I will be giving you 20, 20 minutes to just get in, get in the groove of getting to know each other, even for, for just a short time. So we have certain rooms and we have the facilitators for that room. So these facilitators are volunteers and they are just there to um, help you, guide you through your conversation. So we just want to have the conversation relaxing and chill and just aim for getting to know you and come up with hopefully linkages uh, in Mindanao and even from outside Mindanao. 
So these are the rooms. Uh, for room one, we have Dr. Cecilia Bukayong. For room two, room two, we have Professor Vani Benben. For room three, we have David Hinayon. Room four, we have Joven. Room five, Julina. Room six, Kathy Esquadro. Seven, Samuel, Samuel Toledo. Eight, Professors Ruel and Hishal Baybayon. Room 9, Cherry Ponteras. Room 10, Jake Distacamento. And room 11, Vicky Osigan. So please just give us a, a minute for us to go throughout the breakout room sessions. So thank you so much. <laughs> 